Greetings, listeners. This is an intermediate to advanced Bible study vid of how the Mark and Gospel is structured. It is given by Dr. Richard Carrier, who is an outspoken atheist, yet a very fine scholar for bridging ancient history, literature, and the Holy Scripture. He brings many important things to light for enthusiasts of all persuasions. This recording I dug out of a lecture he gave to some atheist society who probably didn't understand or care for a word he said about the Bible. It is just six or so minutes out of a badly recorded lecture. So we all give thanks to the Almighty who invented WaveLab. Here we go. So let's get to another weird thing. This now this is gets uh, more esoteric. This is more into literary theory. Mythic structure, I call it the original Lord of the Rings. Because the Gospels employ heavily this thing called ring structure. Uh, and that's it's formal terms for it are chiasmus and inclusio. Um, this kind of structure, you see it like the, on the right-hand side, the A, B, C, C, B, A, where you have this sort of onion-layered nesting of ideas that all relate to each other. And so uh, this structure doesn't fit history. History doesn't proceed in this sort of organized way. And I'll show you some examples so you can see what I mean. It's, this was only used in antiquity in real histories or biographies when they were non-chronological. Uh, for example, Suetonius writes a whole bunch of biographies, and all of them follow ring structure very faithfully. But his biographies aren't chronological. They, they start with a birth and end with a death, but everything in between uh, is uh, organized by theme, uh, which makes it possible for him to create his chiasmus. Because history doesn't work out that way, so you have to do it non-chronologically. But the Gospels work chronologically, uh, so you can immediately be suspicious when they start doing this. Uh, this is also, some biblical scholars literally call these Mark and Sandwiches. Uh, and to give you an example, there's a story uh, where there's a dying 12-year-old girl. Jesus is told about this. And then uh, then he goes and heals this girl. But in between, this story is interrupted by another story of a woman who had been bleeding for 12 years. And so this is an inclusio, where we have the, the story starts one way, it gets interrupted by another story, and then the original story ends. And that's telling you that the two stories relate to each other. There's some meaning about that. This is not how history works. This is how literature works. This is how myth is written. Another example is that fig tree I was talking about. Jesus curses the fig tree. So we have the story of Jesus and the cursed fig tree. Then Jesus clears the temple. And then Jesus goes out and confirms that the fig tree is withered and gives a speech about it. So here we have the fig tree cursing story. Stuck in the middle of it is Jesus clearing the temple story. Now, we already know these stories are bogus, so like I told you before. But the fact that they're nested like this, that they're turned into this, this chiasm of, of, of inclusio, of, of, uh, or Mark and Sandwich, as it were, uh, tells you that there's some meaning to it. There's some reason. These stories are related. They're, you're supposed to understand the connection. Uh, now, the ultimate sandwiches are the ones where the, the, go the beginning of a gospel matches the end. And I'm going to talk about that a little bit more. Uh, Mark 1 matches Mark 15 to 16, and we're talking about jo uh, Jesus and John the Baptist and the crucifixion and empty tomb story. And to give you an example of how these are paired up, this is in the Gospel of Mark. John is said to cry with a loud voice, same Greek. Jesus cries with a loud voice, nearly the same Greek. An allusion is made to Elijah in both accounts, and very prominent allusion is made to Elijah. The heavens are torn, using the same Greek word in, in the Baptist story, but in the crucifixion story, the temple curtain is torn, using the exact same Greek word. And in antiquity, the temple curtain involved, the one that would have been torn, was a symbol of the barrier between heaven and earth, and even had the heavens painted on it, uh, we know from Josephus. So these are clearly designed to echo each other. The beginning is designed to match the end. In the beginning, we hear the Holy Spirit descends upon Jesus, literally the pneuma descended on him. And in the crucifixion story, the Holy Spirit departs from Jesus. Literally, he exhaled the pneuma. Uh, in the beginning, God calls Jesus his son. God calls down from heaven and says, You are my son. Uh, in the end, a centurion, a Roman centurion, an official of Rome, calls Jesus God's son. That's not a coincidence. That's deliberate. That was put in there to mimic the beginning. This is how myth proceeds. This is not how history is written. Similarly, the beginning of the Gospel is, Behold, I send my messenger before you, the voice of one calling out in the wilderness, Make ready the way of the Lord. The end of the Gospel, the women who find the empty tomb are told by some young man there, Go, tell uh, his disciples and Peter that he goes before you into Galilee. But the women, they fled from the tomb and they said nothing to anyone. So what do we have here? We have a mirror image. We have the exact opposite that's been transformed. John, a man, delivers the message fearlessly and loudly to everyone preparing the path for the Lord. 
But the women fail to deliver the message they are given, and so do not prepare the path of the Lord because of fear, and instead are silent and tell no one. These are directly opposite of each other. And notice that this is actually how the gospel ends. The women run away and don't tell anyone. That's the weird ending to the gospel. And you wonder why would the gospel end that way? Well, it's ending exactly opposite the way the gospel began. And similarly, in the beginning, Jesus comes from Galilee, uh, and then, El- then enters the wilderness to battle Satan. At the end, Jesus goes to Galilee after having left the wilderness, in this case, the land of the dead, having defeated Satan. Of course, that's not explicitly said, but you're supposed to understand that that's what has happened. So again, the beginning is a mirror image of the, of the ending. That's deliberate. And that's how myth is written. This is another example by Norman Peterson of the triad exact cycles in Mark. Uh, this is a very elegant structure. Uh, this is in the section of Mark that goes from Mark 4 to Mark 8, where we have three cycles with the same phases and then two intervals. And if you look, they're all matching up. Uh, the, the, the exact same story is basically being told three times and interrupted by the exact same story being told two times. But they're not the exact same story. They're, they're tweaked a little bit different. It's meeting different people, but there's a lot of similarities. Now, the key thing here is in each phase occurs during the day, then the next phase occurs during the evening, then the next phase occurs the next day. So that's one complete day, the middle of one day to the middle of the next. Notice what we're talking about here. It's three cycles, three days. So this whole story from Mark 4 to Mark 8 just takes place over three days. When you understand that and read the story, you'll be mind amazed that all of this stuff occurs in three days. It's rather convenient. That's an example of a historical improbability. Very coincidental. 